title for, for this session is Workers in the Kingdom. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about some workmanlike, workmanlike attitudes that are essential for your faith and my faith to impact our world. And it, it's something that's so easy to take for granted, I decided I'd just wear my work clothes, <laughs> which really didn't offend me a lot. I even got to wear my boots. Uh, it beats a suit and tie. But I, I, I want it to be a visual reminder to you that our faith has to be put to the test. It has to be experienced. There's some sweat equity involved. For this particular session, we're going to talk about the personal nature of that. And the Bible says that we're strangers here. It says we're pilgrims, that we're looking for another kingdom, that we're present in this world, but we're not really of this world. It's almost as if we're migratory. We have an assignment while we're here, but we're not to become too enmeshed or too embroiled or too attached. We're moving through. And I know, you know, if you've been around church much or you, you probably have some idea around that language, but we really don't live that way. That's not really the attitude. It looks like to me we're kind of getting rooted in. That our goals and accomplishments and achievement evaluations are pretty much the same as those who don't know the Lord. And so with God's help, we're going to work. Through. I'm going to give you some tools in this session. We're going to stop and do some implementation of some things. And then I'm going to hand some things to you that you can take away from here. And you can decide what you'll do with them. But I want to challenge the status quo of your faith. I don't want to challenge your salvation. I don't want to challenge the confidence you have in your relationship with the Lord. But I want to challenge the notion that the solution to our problems is coming from someplace else. A new political leader, a new ideology, stronger something or other, a better economy, different choices about a border. It's, it's so easy to push this out and think somebody else is going to do something with this. Folks, the people of God are at the center of the unfolding purposes of God in the earth. And if we stay the same and respond the same way and do the same thing, why do we think there's going to be a different outcome? We're asking somebody else to do it. And we're, we're kind of looking around uncomfortably going, I hope they're not asking me for more. And I don't mean in the context of this congregation, but in the context of your faith. John chapter 9 and verse 4, we'll start there. Jesus is speaking. John 9 is one of my favorite chapters. It says, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Now, like many statements in Scripture, that verse can be understood in many ways. It's Jesus speaking. He's responding to a question that the disciples have posed to him. They're in Jerusalem. And they've encountered a man that's blind, and they somehow know he's been blind from birth. Maybe he had a T-shirt on. I don't know. It's not clear in the text, but it's understood. He's introduced to us in that way. And the disciples inquire of Jesus about the nature of sin that resulted in the blindness. Don't you love religious questions? They don't demonstrate any compassion upon the man. They're not directing Jesus towards him for a miracle. They're using it as an object lesson. And Jesus responds to them, not in the way they ask. He said, this isn't about sin. This is not a sin question, he said. We must do the work of him who sent me. I wish you'd notice the pronouns. He doesn't say, I have to do the work of the one who sent me. He said, we do. We've got work to do, he says. And there's a time coming when we won't be able to do that work. I've talked to Angus more than once in recent days. He picked up the phone one day and I said, Angus, how are you? And he said, we're at war. He didn't say, how are you, laddie? Angus is pretty emotive, have you noticed? He wasn't that day. His sons and sons-in-law were protecting the city where they live. And he'd gathered the grandchildren in a chapel on the farm to talk to them about what was happening in their world. And the stores were empty and they were out of fuel and the roads were closed. It was a difficult season. We have to do the work of he, the one who sent us. Night is coming. We've lived such presumptive lives. Oh, we'll, we'll serve God after we do something else. Oh, we'll think about God in another season. It's inconvenient right now. And again, I'm not talking about the ungodly. or the, I'm not talking about somebody. I'm talking about us. And I'm not giving you the, I didn't come to hand you a, an assignment of guilt. I want you to begin to quietly ask the Lord, am I doing the work of God in my life in the way that you created me to do it? 
It's a very important question. In Luke chapter 9, in verse 23, Jesus again, he said, If anyone would come after he, me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If we'd written the 21st century edition of that, Jesus would have said, If anyone would come after me, he'll have to say the sinner's prayer and sit in church from time to time. He'll need to volunteer at a hoedown or such. Jesus didn't talk about our pattern of worship. He's talking about something else. He said, if you'll be my disciple, you'll have to deny yourself and take up a cross daily and follow me. That means daily we're going to have to put something on that cross. Something's going to have to be said no to. Something's going to have to be addressed. See, it seems to me in my experience with Christendom and at least in our culture, there's a bit of a, a, a conflict between kind of the approach of being a passive observer. Be a faithful church attender. Maybe be a Bible reader, even a biblical fact gatherer. Perhaps you could name the 12 tribes or you could name the 66 books of the Bible or maybe at least the 27 books of the New Testament. Maybe you know who the apostles were that Jesus chose. We're biblical fact gatherers. But I would submit on the other side of the ledger is a different approach. It's an assertive follower of Jesus. More what Jesus was talking about. Someone who takes up their cross daily and follows him. That's not informational. That's work. That's fact. In fact, that's hard work. In fact, I would submit to you that Jesus is describing, if you'll allow me to use some good Middle Tennessee descriptions, the activity of a field hand. Not somebody telling others what to do. Not somebody that knows what needs to be done. Folks, we've been sitting in that seat in the church. We know how things should be done. We're not about to do it, but we know how they should be done. We know how the politicians should do it. We know how the pastors should do it. We know how the teachers should do it. We know how things should be done, but we have, we have little intention of doing it. I want to invite you out of that seat of the passive observer into the attitude of a field hand. There's work to be done, and if we don't do it, it won't get done. Now, it's kingdom work. Thank God we don't have to bale hay and haul it anymore. Been there and done that. I sold that t-shirt. <laughs> Field hands for the kingdoms are going to be interested in things like in, being intercessors, being harvesters. The fields are white with harvest, Jesus said. We've got to walk into the harvest fields and help people out into the kingdom. We'll have to be willing to pray for the sick, cast out demons. I won't ask for a show of hands. We'd rather have seminars on that. How many years do you have to go to church before you're going to start practice what we've heard about all these years? I mean, how long does that string of Sunday school pins have to get before we decide we have been commissioned? Well, I don't know as much as I, neither do I. Doctors practice. <laughs> you go to the best doctors in the world and I promise you, they'll look at you and go, I don't know. Not sure what's causing it. Don't know how to fix it. And you pay them. What's happened to Christians? Well, until I understand fully, I'm just going to stay right here on the sidelines. You will miss what God created you for. We live in a world where there are kingdoms in conflict. Have you noticed? The kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. That conflict is raging in our earth. It is shaking the foundations of our world these days. Immorality is being celebrated in the public square in unprecedented ways. Truth has stumbled, as the prophet said. And the church is struggling to figure out what to do with that. And it's not just in our nation, in the nations of the world. In John 3 and verse 5, Jesus gives us the key. He's speaking to a leader of the, the Jewish community in Jerusalem. He said, I tell you the truth. You know by now when you see that phrase, better buckle up. I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You have to be born again, Jesus said. Wait a minute, Nicodemus, I'm a, I belong to the covenant people of God. I'm keeping the rules of Moses. I've got the right holidays. I eat the right foods. I know the books of Moses. And you're looking at me saying no entry into the kingdom of God unless something else. If you are trusting something ahead of that relationship with Jesus, you're in danger. Joining the church won't do that for you. 
Having a lamp, being in our system. So when you put your number in, you get a little t- tag printed out. Well, that's not what you look for at the pearly gate. You've got to know Jesus. Not only that, you need to know how to help other people get to know Jesus. It's harvest time. There is no solution to the problems that are facing us unless we see exponential growth in the number of people who believe Jesus is Lord. There will be a continued erosion of a biblical worldview and a diminishment of people who believe the word of God is authoritative in their lives. People celebrating all sorts of idolatrous things. They'll wrap it in all sorts of religious sounding language, but it won't be centered in the person of Jesus. That's our assignment. With the sphere of influence you have and the sphere of influence I have, wherever God opens those doors, we've got to be willing to help people. You know that prayer. I gave it to you. I put it in your notes. If you don't know the prayer to help somebody into the kingdom of God, take a picture of it with your phone. Keep it there. Put it in the front of your Bible. Put it someplace where you don't lose it. Whatever format, old school, new school, you need access to that until you commit it to your heart. In fact, we ought to just say it together. Why don't you repeat it after me? Almighty God, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I believe Jesus of Nazareth is the son of God. I believe that he died on a cross for my sins. And I believe he was raised to life again for my justification. Almighty God, forgive me of my sins. And I forgive all those who've sinned against me. Jesus be Lord of my life. All that I have, all that I am, all that I'll ever be. I want to live for your glory. And I thank you now that I belong to the family of God. Amen. Hallelujah. If you've never prayed that prayer and meant it, that is the doorway into the kingdom. It's not about you. It's about a gift that God provided for us through his son, Jesus. But to pray that prayer and imagine you've got everything is as goofy as looking through a newborn baby in the the nursery of the hospital and say, they've got everything. They've got all the equipment they need, but if they don't grow up, they're going to miss a lot. Agreed? And there's a lot of us sitting around church in diapers with a passy. We've had the same experience in church 30 years in a row. I didn't call your name. But I want you to have that in your portfolio if you meet somebody. If somebody says, you know, if... Maybe they've got a life challenge or a difficult diagnosis or a problem in front of them. And you hear fear and anxiety. And then there's an opportunity to pray with them. The most significant prayer I know to pray with a person is to invite Jesus into my life. I've watched people be healed of terminal diseases when they prayed that prayer. I've seen them delivered from demonic involvement and curses broken over their lives without any further, anything beyond the willingness to invite Jesus as Lord into your life. Set free from addictions. You don't have to fix their problems. Introduce them to Jesus. And the Spirit of God will put their feet on a path to lead them towards a better place. Trust Him. Has He been good for you? Has He changed your life? Why would you not tell a coworker or a neighbor or a family member or somebody else about Him? Because we trust other things. We get more heated up about other things. Now, once you've been birthed into the kingdom, the reality is we've got to get cleaned up. Even newborn babies have to get cleaned up. I grew up with a veterinarian. All those little critters we helped be born, they all had to be cleaned up. I got in on some of that. But it really begins with a choice in your life. The Holy Spirit will not force you to change. He'll convict you. He'll prompt you. He'll make you uncomfortable. But if you choose to stay in your selfish, carnal, ungodly self, he won't force you. You don't ever have to be concerned about God making you do something you don't want to do. He gave you the freedom of choice 
And he'll allow you to choose to spend your eternity separate from him if you want to. He'll allow you to choose to waste your days under the sun. It's a choice. James chapter 1 and verse 21. I'm going to go through these passages pretty quickly. James is the in your face book in the New Testament. If you're having kind of a blue day, don't read James. Because he'll just kind of slap you around a little bit. You, you won't need any interpretation. You'll know what he means. James 1, 21, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Doesn't need much commentary. Get rid of all moral filth. Throw it out. Get rid of it like the trash. It stinks. It'll destroy you. It's corrosive. Don't tolerate it. Be as anxious to separate yourself from that as you were COVID a few months ago. Ephesians chapter four and verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life before you were birthed into the kingdom of God to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Your old self was filled with deceitful schemes and corruption. The new self, if you choose to put it on, remember what Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. It's a daily choice. You can't make that choice last week and it impacts you today. You have to make that choice today. But if you put on the new self, it will allow righteousness and holiness to begin to flourish in your life. So I thought righteousness was a gift. Well, it is. Your faith in Jesus means you're made the righteousness of God in Christ. But the value you attach to that gift of righteousness is your choice to live righteously. You don't earn it, but you have to choose it to let that fruit grow in your life. The same way you have to choose to plant a garden. Most of us would like summer vegetables in our front yard. But most of us don't want to till the soil, plant those rascals, water it, spray the bugs, hoe it, weed it. I'll just go to the farmer's market. Ephesians 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander along with every form of malice. Then we've got a list going of what we're supposed to get rid of. Moral filth, your old self. Bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, every form of malice, every form of ill will towards somebody else. You can't afford to carry that. you got to get rid of it. Galatians 5 gets down into the weeds. Verse 19, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. All of these passages are written to, to the church. They're not written to the ungodly. All of these things exist in the life of God's people. That's why we're being told to get rid of them to not tolerate them, to, to put off something and to put on something else. It's describing for us a transition that is the journey of a Christ follower. It's not completed with a sinner's prayer or brought to a conclusion with a dip in a pool. Those are important parts of the journey, but the substance of taking your cross daily and following the Lord of being a disciple means as you grow and mature and life continues to push its challenges to you in every season, they're coming that you'll take this advice and continue to implement it. Galatians 5, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before. They've been told this before. Those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's some cultural debates around some rather ungodly behaviors. And the church is struggling to, to address that oftentimes. I would point out scripture seems to make a distinction between the struggle with sin, the challenge with sin, the temptation of sin, and the yielding and the commitment to become a practitioner of sin. You can't practice sin and think that you will inherit the kingdom of God. It's the clear counsel of scripture. So I would submit to you that you're not a friend. You're not expressing the love of God when you encourage one another to practice sin and think that God will be okay with that. You don't have to be angry, judgmental, critical, harsh, mean-spirited, belligerent. You don't have to be those things. 
Any more than it's mean-spirited or belligerent or critical or of a doctor to give you a diagnosis that you'd rather not hear. You need the truth in order to have a protocol or a pathway towards being healthy. The same is true when you face spiritual challenges. We have to choose to be clean. It's not that complicated. You have to want to be. And anytime you see something that's inhibiting or limiting or diminishing or that's a, it's a burden that you don't have to carry or an attitude that's not helpful, you say, thank you for helping me to see that. I'd like to be free of that. It's not an intrusion. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is not something to be ashamed of. It's something to be celebrated. When the Spirit of God shows you an idea, an attitude, a practice, something in your past, whatever it may be that is an encumbrance, it's not an intrusion. It's not a, an angry act. It's an invitation to freedom. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, God, for helping me see that. I never knew that. I didn't understand. So often we're angry at the messenger. Well, you know, I don't know if I believe that or not. Get your Bible out and figure it out. Now, the pathway towards that freedom is important. Because it's not, it's not just arbitrary or whimsical any more than the new birth is. You have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth or the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross will not benefit you. Do you understand? So the truth of scripture is one thing, but the truth of scripture engaging your life and being a benefit to you is a totally different thing. So the choice is important. That's an important thing. But the pathway to that freedom, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 21. This is Paul. He's writing to the Corinthian church, maybe the most supernatural of the New Testament churches, miracles, all sorts of things, and also the most carnal. All sorts of immorality and drunkenness, all sorts of problems in the church in Corinth. Paul says, I'm afraid that when I visit again, my God will humble me before you and I'll be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, the sexual sin or the debauchery. Debauchery is a fancy word. It means excess. Extravagance. 2 Timothy 3 talks about the love of pleasure more than the love of God. Debauchery. Sexual sin and debauchery in which they have indulged. He's writing to a church, a spirit-filled church, filled with the supernatural. And he said, before I get there, some of you need to repent. So if you want to look for the pathway, let's start with repentance. Repentance is a change of thought and a change of behavior. When the Holy Spirit convicts you of a behavior, say, well, I didn't know that was sin. It may not be sin in one of those classic categories of sexual immorality or stealing or lying. But if it's something that impedes what God created you to be and the Holy Spirit is convicting you of it, turn loose of it. Turn loose of it. Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't understand. Don't justify it. Don't excuse it. It's a gift when the Holy Spirit, repent, change your mind and change your behavior. And we get a little further amplification in 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know? And when the Bible starts with that phrase, what's the answer? Probably not. <laughs> Don't you know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? We've heard that before, haven't we? So it, it's been a consistent struggle with God's people through the ages. That we think, well, if we belong to the right group or we celebrate the right holidays or we have the right books on ourselves, that we must be okay. You can't practice wickedness and inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. And then he gives us a list. It's not an all-inclusive list, but again, it's another representative sample. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. That's the description of the folks in the church. Then and now. That's what we were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Now we're looking for a pathway out of those places to get rid of moral filth. We're looking for a way to take off our old self and to put on the new self. It's not about pretending or deception or hiding or rewriting the rule book or finding somebody with letters at the end of their names or somebody that has influential influence in some church system that agrees with the particular place I'm standing apart from the word of God. 
The pathway has to do with repentance. And now there were three more components introduced. It says that's what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Now, how do we achieve those things? How do we find ourselves washed? How do we understand it? What does it mean to be sanctified, to be justified? How do we achieve them? Do you attend church? Does enough time pass from the offending behavior that just because you've turned the calendar enough times, you're washed? Maybe cultural standards change. We're watching a lot of that. We're redefining all kinds of things these days. Marriage, immorality, all kinds of things being redefined. Well, fortunately, we have the counsel of Scripture. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. How do we get clean? Through the blood of Jesus. What gives us access to the blood of Jesus in our lives? The redemptive work of Jesus on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, accomplished an eternal, irreversible victory for anyone who will put their faith in him as Lord and Savior. It's why Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But that historical fact doesn't just automatically bring cleanliness to our lives. We have to accept it by faith as we recognize the need. You can't just pray this kind of this generalist prayer. You know, oh God, so sorry. It's Alan. Peace out. <laughs> and they'll live any way you want to. You know, you have to teach kids how to be clean. Is that right, parents? If you leave them on their own, they're not going to figure that out. I remember being sent back to wash my hands or my elbows or my ears multiple times. And I was totally mystified that they could see dirt because I didn't see any. We had very different standards of cleanliness. I had to be coached into that. And we're the same way with the Lord. As we come out of the world and as we continue to grow and mature and God needs to depend upon you in greater ways. He needs to be able to entrust you with his truth more fully and more completely because we need outcomes of greater significance than we did a year or two or three years ago. So we need to be clean in new ways. Clean of things that we've tolerated and accepted. And it comes to us, we're told, through the blood of Jesus. Father, I repent. Forgive me of my sin. And you say it by name. God, I've tolerated that. I didn't understand it was sinful. I didn't know my casual attitude about what I watched or the words I used or the coarse things I would say or the attitudes I've held towards other people. I wasn't conscious that, that they were impeding my relationship. I'm sorry, God, forgive me of that. I put it under the blood of Jesus. Cleanse me from it. Whatever the Spirit of God shows you, don't just accept it. Don't just shrug your shoulders and go, oh, it's good enough. No, it isn't. You don't want the doctors that operate on you thinking, oh, I'm clean enough. I took a shower this morning. I'm not going to scrub in. I haven't shaken more than a dozen hands since I got to the office today. Now, before they touch you, you want them to be as clean as humanly possible. Why would we be less concerned? So we've got cleansing. We've got a little idea around that. Hebrews chapter 13 will help us with sanctified. Jesus, that he might sanctify the people. It's something he's going to do for us, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood. Suffered outside the gate. Sanctify is a religious word, and it carries a, a unique meaning in Scripture. To be sanctified is to be set apart for the purposes of God. If you're doing the Bible reading with us, we just finished kind of pushing our way through the back half of the books of Moses. You've got to love God to read Leviticus and Numbers. Right? But when, they, when God gives them the instructions on how to build the tabernacle and the priests that are going to serve and Aaron and his sons and all of those people, remember all those rather elaborate instructions? They couldn't just throw up a tent and put an animal on the grill and say, worship God. 
God said, no, we have to sanctify that. We have to set that structure apart for my purposes. This is how it'll be built. This is how it'll be transported. The people that are to serve in that place have to be prepared to serve in that place. There, were, there are prescriptions for their physical cleanliness. There is an anointing and an, an invitation to the Spirit of God. There's an anointing that is a separation to separate them from any other activities. Sanctified. That was for the purposes of God. That wasn't just a structure to get in out of the sun. And to be sanctified by the blood of Jesus means your life has been set apart for the purposes of God. Not just to be blessed so you've got some extra power to help you get ahead of the competition in this world. That your life is on a different path, has a different purpose, has a different objective. There's a different set of rules you're taking up across daily to be a disciple of Jesus. Sanctified by the blood of Jesus. And the significance of what you're set apart for is reflected in what it is that sets you apart. If you're set apart with a, an anointing of some oil to serve in the tabernacle, that's a type of the Holy Spirit. But it's the blood of the Son of God that sanctifies us. A kingdom of priests, it says. Now you've got to be willing to sanctify your life. God won't do that to you. You'll have to bring your life to Him. How you use your time, how you use your money what you long to become and what you desire to do, you'll, you'll have to begin to rewire some desires. So, well, it's not immoral or ungodly. No, it just it represents all sorts of interests that are ahead of your desire to please the Lord. We, we've filled our churches with these idolatrous attitudes, all kinds of hyphenated Christians. We haven't sanctified ourselves to the Lord. I haven't had any intent of doing it. I'm not sure anybody's talked to us about it. There was one more component. It said we had to be justified. Look at Romans 5, 9. It says we've been justified by his blood. We have now been justified. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? See, it's the blood of Jesus that stands between us and the wrath of God. Justified is another word that has a, something of a specific definition in the New Testament. To be justified, the best definition I heard or the simplest was to be just, just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. Well, why would that matter? Because one day you're going to stand before the king. And you don't want to show up with all your junk. You want to know you've been Justified. Again, how do you do that? Do you have to attend? How many worship services do I have to attend before I get my justification badge? All right? How many times do I have to read through my Bible? Four? <sighs> Lord, don't come till I get through four. No, we're justified by the blood of Jesus. But it's something that you have to apply and live in and long for. It's not about presumption. Now, the real question is, how do we give expression to these things in our lives? How am I doing? Listen fast. I want to step back in the Old Testament for a minute. Do you know what the Passover is? It's in that period of, of time when the, the Hebrews are slaves in Egypt. They've been there for a long time, hundreds of years. They have no memory of freedom. In fact, they were never a free people. They were a free family, but it was an extended family that came to Egypt and by the time we meet them in the book of Exodus, they've grown into a multitude of people. That multitude of people has never occupied the land of Canaan. They've never had a capital city. They've never had a central government. So all of their memories, all of their self-awareness has to do with being enslaved in Egypt. But the suffering became so grievous, the treatment so abusive, that they cry out to God. And he takes mercy on them and he sends them a deliverer. Who's his name? Moses, it's not a trick question. I'm not above it, but that wasn't one. <laughs> and so that's the plagues. And you know the plagues and the decimation of Egypt's gods and the destruction of their economy and their military. And, and finally, the last of the plagues is the Passover. God says to Moses, tell the people to take a lamb and prepare it. Because tonight, death is coming to the land. And in every household in Egypt where the blood of the lamb isn't on the doorpost, death will come. 
And tomorrow you're leaving. In fact, the Passover meal has to be prepared in a hasty way. There's no leaven in the bread. You don't have time for the bread to rise. It's eaten with bitter herbs because your, your sojourn in Egypt has been bitter. The Jewish people celebrate the Passover until today. It is one of the most significant events in their history as a people. 1 Corinthians 11. I'm sorry, I skipped Exodus 12. I'll get to 1 Corinthians. God, this is Moses giving on that same night. God says, I'll pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. All those plagues were judgments on the various gods of Egypt. Look at verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon. And the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. The only households where there, weren't, there wasn't death was in the households where the blood of the lamb had been put on the doorpost. You suppose there were any of the Hebrew slaves that didn't put blood on their doorpost? Yeah, I do. How anxious do you think the Egyptians would have been for those people to be out of town? Imagine if in the morning in every house in Rutherford County something died. Can you imagine the panic, the fear? I can't. They literally drove the Hebrew slaves out. Take our gold, take our silver, take whatever you want. Leave us. Leave us. And the only protection between death and freedom was the blood on the doorpost. We'll push forward to the New Testament, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, that's very close to the beginning of John's gospel. Chapter 1. <laughs> and John the Baptist sees Jesus approaching him. And this is his, his statement about Jesus. John saw Jesus coming toward him. He said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now for you and me, there we could maybe talk about metaphors and imagery, but I submit to you that to that first century audience, they understood the Passover. They celebrate every year. They understand the impact of the blood of that lamb and the difference it made in their lives. And John says, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We just looked at the blood of Jesus that enables us to repent and be forgiven, to be washed to be sanctified, to be justified. But for the blood of that Passover lamb to be effective, it had to get out of the basin and onto the doorpost of those homes. Do you suppose anybody prepared the lamb but didn't want to mess up their front door? I suspect it's possible. Can you, can you imagine that any group of people that's numbered in the thousands would get complete, absolute compliance it's hard for me to imagine, isn't it for you? And in order for the blood to be effective to protect you from the judgment of God, it had to be applied to the door. Well, the blood of Jesus has to be applied to your life and my life for it to be a benefit to us. It can be told about in here. You can believe it's true. You can say, oh, I believe all that stuff, but never give it application. Oh, I believe Jesus lived. I believe he was a good man, a miracle worker. I might even believe he's the son of God. But if I don't confess it with my mouth, the benefit doesn't come to me. Repent and believe. So how do we take the blood of Jesus and give it application in our lives? Revelation 12 says, They, the believers on earth, overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they didn't love their lives so much as to shrink from death. When you give testimony, when you give verbal affirmation to what the word of God says the blood of Jesus does for you, you give it application in your life. You believe it in your heart and you confess it with your mouth. Well, I've never heard that before. That's why we're talking about it. I brought you a confession around the blood of Jesus. Again, this is for your reference later. Share it with somebody. It's a summary statement of those verses we've read. You can go back and fit the verses to the statements. I'll just read it to you. I testify as to what the word of God says the blood of Jesus does for me. Through the blood of Jesus, I am redeemed out of the hand of the devil. Through the blood of Jesus, all my sins are forgiven. 
The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, continually cleanses me from all sin. Through the blood of Jesus, I'm sanctified, made holy, set apart to God. Through the blood of Jesus, I'm justified, made righteous, just as if I'd never sinned. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, redeemed, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, Satan has no place in me, no power over me through the blood of Jesus. I wonder if you'd say that with me. Can we say that together? You can read it. It's in your notes. I won't have to give it to you a sentence at a time. We're accustomed to reading prayers, right? Okay, I want to be sure I had the right group. Y'all were kind of quiet. Let's read it together. I testify as to what the word of God says the blood of Jesus does for me. Through the blood of Jesus, I am redeemed out of the hand of the devil. Through the blood of Jesus, all my sins are forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, continually cleanses me from all sin. Through the blood of Jesus, I am sanctified, made holy, set apart to God. Through the blood of Jesus, I'm justified, made righteous, just as if I'd never sinned. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, redeemed, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, Satan has no place in me and no power over me through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now share, if you know somebody that's walking through a difficult place, or if you are, take that confession about what the word of God says about you and begin to give it application in your life. Do you really think that makes it? I know it does. I have lived that out myself and, and made that journey with multitudes of people. Stop being collectors of information and let's go to work. Let's roll up our sleeves and take God's truth and give it expression in this generation. Amen. It's time. We've trusted everything else. We've trusted the economy and the political process and political parties. And I'm not opposed to any of those things, but they will not bring freedom to us. I'm happy for doctors, I, 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 all those good things. I'm, I'm grateful for their lives, but I approach them with faith in the power of God and through the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a communion weekend. And I've really done all of this to get to this point. We're going to receive communion together in a moment, but I want to do something beyond that. Because it's so easy for communion to be a tradition in the church or a ritual in the church. And you kind of, your brain goes kind of numb because you know you're almost done. You start to think about where you're going to eat. And I want to give you a bit of assignment around communion. Let's first look at 1 Corinthians 11 first. Again, this is written to a church, spirit-filled church. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. It ought to have our attention. You can receive communion in an unworthy way. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks of the cup. You don't need commentary on that. Before you receive the elements of communion, some self-examination is appropriate. Any unfinished business? Anything you need to talk to the Lord about? Anything you've hidden from everybody else, but you need to present it to the Lord? He's about to tell us why, but I don't want to get to the why until you understand self-examination is an appropriate part of receiving communion. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. It's a euphemism for died. I don't believe that the, there, there are many ways you can interpret that. There's, there's certainly more than one. But it seems to me that it's not so much a, a threat that if you eat sloppily, God's going to strike you down in the fashion of Ananias and Sapphira. It seems to me it's far more an invitation to understand how to repent and how to be cleansed and how to be sanctified and justified so that you receive the benefit of the blood of Jesus. And if you don't come to the communion table thoughtfully, and you don't come to the communion table having reflected a bit and understood what you're trusting God for, that you will forfeit the benefits and the blessings of God. 
We've been presumptive. Well, I want everything God has for me. Folks, that's not how it works. That's just goofy as going to the university and say, well, I just want all the information that's here. Don't you wish it worked like that? Walking in the gym, I just want my muscles to be exercised by all the equipment in this place. <laughs> yeah, me too, while I eat donuts. <laughs> but you have to go to work. You have to go to work in the university. You have to go to work in the, in the gym. And you have to give application to God's truth. We've preferred seminars. We'd rather have a debate on whether or not God still does miracles. Well, you know, I just don't know how I feel about that. How you feel about it is secondary to what God says about it. I understand feelings are powerful. That communion is something that we typically learn together at worship. And I think there's a good thing about that. It keeps it from being flippant. It isn't casual. It's open to all believers. You don't have to be a member of this church or dipped in our pool. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you would be welcome to the Lord's table. And it's not the sole authority of pastors or priests or professional Christians. Now, I know there have been seasons in the church history where communion has been used in that way. And I don't really want to unpack all that history. I can just tell you it's, a, it's an expression of power that's held tremendous leverage. But I believe that the New Testament tells us that we are all kings and priests. That if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have access to the communion table without a professional Christian attached. So let's think about communion for just a moment. Ways that we could think about it beyond how we've understood it. I understand that it is the function of church and we've grown up in different traditions and your tradition has a lot of emotion attached to how you know communion. And, and you no doubt think it's the right way particularly if it's something that's come to you since childhood. But there's no single Christian tradition, and by that I mean denomination, that has a hammer lock on the whole truth. There are none. Let's start with communion. It's personal. When you come to the communion table, when you come to the bread and the cup, you want to begin, first of all, by repenting of anything you need to. You want to be cleansed. You want to forgive anyone who needs forgiven. You want to be sanctified. Lord, I give you my life. I'm not just asking you to bless me or prosper me or help my kids get whatever. I, I'm giving you my life. And you want to be justified through the blood of Jesus. Made righteous. Thank you, Father. If for nothing else, it should be a, an inward celebration, the gift that communion represents to you. But I want to ask you to think about communion beyond that. And I understand this is a little less traditional, but I want to plant some seeds. What if you had communion with your family? Apart from a church service. What would you do? Well, it's time for school to start back. Maybe parents, you just gather your children that are getting ready to go to school. and You say as a part of communion, I want to ask the kids to forgive us. When we haven't been the best parents we might have been. Maybe you encourage the children to repent when they have been less than they should have been, more rebellious, more stubborn. And then take the elements of communion and ask God to bring new layers of sanctification and justification and cleansing into your lives. So I'd feel a little awkward doing that. Yeah, it's because you've never done it before. Folks, we haven't really taken God's truth and given it application. We've checked the Bible. Oh, I know all about that. I've done that a thousand times. Why don't we do it this way? And why do we do it with those plastic cups? And blah, 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 blah. Stop it. Stop it. There's lots of things in the context of your family. You could take communion and ask God to forgive us for our indulgent living. We have so much. And we stamp our feet like petulant children and demand more. We could repent of our marginal interest in the things of God. We could give God an invitation, an invitation to the Holy Spirit. We're ready for our assignments in this family, God. New school year, new beginning. We're ready for your assignments, not just ours. Most of you know what you want out of the school year. Teams you want to make, groups you want to be included in. 
about God's assignments? Well, you know, I'm saved. How about communion at a birthday celebration? Thank you, God, that you've, you've kept us through this year. And we're turning a calendar page. How about your children understanding the significance you attach to inviting God into their lives? What about communion at a holiday gathering? Before you get to the gluttony. Let's take it to a context outside of your family. What about communion at work? Now I'm meddling. I'm not suggesting you jump up on the desk at work and whip out your saltines. But if there's another believer where you work, or two or three, maybe on a break or around a lunch break, or just quietly, I wouldn't announce it, I wouldn't tell anybody, but, but what if you took communion and said, God, let this workplace become a lighthouse for the kingdom of God? What if we rolled up our sleeves and treated this like it mattered? What if we got serious with it? What if you got together and took communion with some coworkers and you said, God, help us to work with integrity, to live free of gossip and complaining and laziness? Or maybe you have some supervisory roles. God, help us to lead in a way that God honors you with our attitude, with concern for others and not just prophets. Maybe you have communion with your neighbors. Are they Christians? Do you know? Do you care? You can blame me the first time my pastor's got this goofy idea. We want to see God honored in this neighborhood. We want it to be hard to live in this neighborhood and miss Jesus. God, we don't want anybody to live for 12 months in this neighborhood and not come to know you in a personal way. Help us, God. Folks, this could be done. This is achievable. You have enough information. How about communion with the sports teams? All kinds of youth leagues, adult leagues. Everybody in here has been touched directly or indirectly by some kind of a sports league. We worship the stuff. And I played sports most of my life. What if you had communion with the team? May God be honored in our time together. That'll change how you think about that interaction. May God be pleased with us, how we conduct ourselves, how we interact with one another, the language we use, what's instilled in the hearts of these children. We have got to bring our faith back into play in the world in which we live and stop relegating it to a few minutes on the weekend. We do. And we're going to take communion together, but I've given you some tools. I've given you a prayer to introduce somebody to the kingdom. I've given you the blood of Jesus confession. I brought you the communion scripture. So if you're going to try this at work or at home, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 will get you through. It says he broke bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Have you ever heard that before? And then he took a cup and said, this cup is a new covenant, right? In my blood. You've got the language and the verse that goes with it. You're equipped. Have me even be willing to take communion outside of a worship service. Look at that. Imagine what could happen in our community. Imagine what could happen. We're going to take communion together. Tomorrow we're going to talk about what this means in the public square. This is the private life. The work of the kingdom in our lives. Communion didn't start with a pastor. Our Lord put this in place. Oh, by the way, they had just completed the Passover meal. And they're going to leave that upper room and go to Gethsemane where he'll be arrested and begin the sequence of events that will lead him to the cross. And at the end of the Passover meal, he took a piece of bread and broke it and said, this bread is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive together. Then he took a cup. 
So this cup is a new covenant, a new contract, sealed with my blood. And as often as you drink it, you proclaim my death until you see me again. Let's receive together. You stand with me for this prayer. I know some of you are here to be baptized. As soon as I say amen, head to the pool. If they have on a purple shirt, let them in front of you. I don't want the ice to melt in the pool before they get there. <laughs> and we're going to pray. If there's anything you need to release to the Lord, if there's anything you want to be free of, if there's any place where you want to invite him in, it's not based on our goodness or, or our effort or our holiness. It's through the blood of Jesus. That's why we come to the communion table. Father, thank you for your word, for its truth and power and authority. I thank you for the honor of being together and of looking at your word. And tonight as we've received the bread and the cup, we receive your life into our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done for us. We come in humility to repent of our sin, to lay down anything that we're conscious of that would have separated us from you, any behavior, any attitude, any thought. Lord, if there are those we need to forgive, we set them free tonight. If there is anger or resentment or bitterness or hatred, Lord, we lay it down. We ask you to forgive us as, as we release those others. Lord, some in our midst, need a miracle tonight. I pray that you bring health to their bodies. Where there's been sickness and disease, that it will yield and relent and, and health and strength and vitality and life will come. What others are captive by fear and anxiety and uncertainty. And I pray the peace of God will fill our hearts and our minds. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your provision for us. That we have been delivered out of all the hand of the enemy. That his power over our lives is broken. We've been washed clean and made whole, sanctified and justified through the blood of Jesus. That we are free tonight. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content and we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.